Welcome everyone. I'm Craig Kissick and I'm the Vice President of Nature and Science for Heritage Auctions. And today I have the uh, absolute thrill to be talking to my friend and the finder of the LSAWS meteorite, Phil Manny. Phil is a oil and gas attorney and most importantly he is a meteorite collector and finder extraordinaire. I've known Phil for a long time and today I want to talk about the very exciting story about how he found, found the El Sal's meteorite, but I want to start by asking Phil a couple of questions about what really got him into meteorites. So, welcome Phil, thank you so much for doing this. Um, just for those who, who might not know, tell us what really first seriously got you involved in meteorites and meteorite collecting. Well, my training in school is as a geologist and I've got degrees from Trinity and from Texas A&M in geology. Um, in about 1998, I saw an auction where meteorites were being auctioned, and I was um, interested in knowing that you could own a meteorite. <laughs> yes. I didn't know you could do that. So uh, I bought one at the auction, and then I bought another, and then I researched, and um, then things kind of exploded from there. And the rest is history. Yes. Okay, very good. Well, one thing just to give everybody that, that, that may not know, you were very instrumental in, in the Brenham meteorite that was in Kansas. Why don't you tell us That's a little right. bit about that? Because that was certainly a precursor to this adventure that you had with El Salas. Right. The, uh, the, Brenham, um, the Brenham expedition that we did was in 2005. And the idea there was to, uh, in looking at old reported um, finds of the Brenham Palisite and Brenham Irons was to go back to that strewn field with new interpretation of what the strewn field uh, distribution looked like, um, to lease the land from the um, landowners for hunting meteorites over a period of a couple of years. And we were very successful finding 36 meteorites uh, over that period that weighed over 6,000 total pounds. Well, yeah, so you've, I know some of the individual ones were enormous, and you've done one of the great things about Phil is that you, you will donate meteorites, and you work a lot with institutions and museums to share the knowledge of that. So how did that come up with Brenham? I know you did a lot with the Monig at TCU. So what, how did that kind of come together? Right, it was uh, Art Elman, who was the curator of mm -hmm. the Monig collection, is the one that really taught me about meteorites and took his time on a Saturday one wow. day. And then when we were making the discoveries up in Kansas um, for the Brenham meteorites, um, I invited Art to come up and oh, hunt cool. uh, for a meteorite. And that was actually the very first one that Art ever found. Really? It was wow. a 130 pound iron that we <laughs> dug from about four feet below the surface. How great for him, because I mean, he's a wonderful guy. He was a wonderful guy and he was a legend. I mean, it's the legendary Art Elman for sure. So. He is, yes. Wow, that's awesome. And then some of the Brenhams you had on display at TCU for a while, right, and among other places? So. I, the largest one was on display shortly in Fort Worth, and it's been around the world um, since 2015. It's been down at Space Center Houston, mm -hmm. NASA Space Center Houston, on oh. exhibit right as you come in the door. That's we feel maybe around 8 million people have seen it so far. Fantastic. Well, great, okay, well, let's not waste any more time. Let's get right to it. So LSAWS was a fairly recent witness fall in South Texas, and you were instrumental in, in bringing this thing to, to our collective knowledge. So why don't you tell us the, tell us the story about how you found out about LSAWS, how you went after it, and how you were so successful recovering it. All right, so <clears throat> it was on uh, February 15th, 2023, at about 5.22 in the evening, a fireball um, going from east to west was streaking across the um, um, uh, McAllen and uh, Mission, Texas area, moving towards the west, wow. towards Rio Grande City. Um, that was the witnessed fireball. That was also followed by a uh, um, sonic boom that was heard by a number of people who called in and were curious about sure. it. Um, later that evening, um, I got a call at about 10.30 in the evening from my friend Robert Ward, who had been in touch with Mark Fries and, and Linda Fries mm -hmm. at NASA. And um, Mark had done some research on the Doppler signatures and had seen that this fireball probably produced stones that were found at about 47 kilometers altitude and then again on the Doppler radar at about 14 a uh, thousand kilometers altitude. Mm -hmm. So projecting that towards the ground, we knew the approximate area where stones could have landed. 
they reached out to me because all the lands were privately owned and they thought I might be able to help being uh, that's what I do you know as an attorney I, I looked at the the next morning I looked at the um, appraisal district records and looked at the maps and I found that the area for where these stones would have landed was pretty much within a ranch um, that was owned by a trust out of San Antonio. In looking at the address for where the trust receives its mail, I realized I knew the people um, who were the owners. And so um, it turns out that uh, it was somebody that I had gone to junior high and high school with. Wow. And, um, and so I reached out to him, told him this story about meteorites probably on the ground and uh, and that's how it all uh, started. Well that sounds pretty serendipitous to put it mildly. But, oh it really and, was. And I love the idea about the, the Doppler and everything so this is a little more sophisticated than just a couple of guys jumping out the back of a pickup truck with a rock hammer. It sounds like you're you're really using some science to pinpoint where these things might be. Right so Doppler you know you can see hailstones and mm -hmm. in, in thunderstorms and all that and they can sometimes see how about how big the hailstones are. So the same sort of information works for do for these stones as they're falling, yeah. um, you know, in a line uh, down to the ground. And and also picked up on Doppler was some of the ash deposits, oh, wow. the the fine debris that burned up. Well, yeah, and I, I think I heard it was projected that maybe ninety percent of LSAs didn't make it through the atmosphere. So what's what hits the Earth as a meteorite is actually a pretty finite group of an already very finite material. That's right. The uh, NASA believed that the original meteoroid was weighed about a thousand pounds, probably 90 to 95 percent of it burned up. That would leave somewhere between uh, 50 to 100 pounds of stones on the ground, okay. and five large stones were found, some other small ones were found, and barely uh, about just around 12 pounds has been recovered. Wow, okay, well obviously so. this little collage behind us, we can see it was quite a rugged place. We've got meteorites hitting a tree, we've got you know, with stories of rattlesnakes and all kinds of amazing stuff. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the the adventure just that led up to it, and then of course you finding this beautiful specimen that we get to present here at auction. So um, the once we had an agreement with the the landowner to go out and hunt, which took about two days. Sure. Um, Robert Ward and uh, Mark Fries and Linda were out there on a Saturday, Saturday the 18th. Okay. And Robert, in driving along some of the roads, finds this 444 gram wow. piece. And that was the first uh, stone that was found. Okay. And uh, that's actually, I believe, the 31st stone that um, Robert has been the discoverer okay. of. Wow. So he's a very prolific yes. meteorite hunter. I was happy to be hunting with him. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, uh, Two days later, um, I um, was coming across uh, this stone, which was mostly buried. About 20% of it was above ground. This weighs almost two and a half pounds. Oh boy, okay. And, um, and this is the same stone once I pulled it out of the ground. Excellent. Um, and of course, there we are. We didn't have the gloves, but we were not touching it. Yep. We were putting it in baggies and, and trying to preserve it so these stones haven't been touched by hand. No, well, that's what we love about this. It's, and we, you know, it's the first, first piece being offered at auction, and certainly it's as pristine as it could possibly be. So tell us about this exact piece that you were kind enough to share with us. How did you actually find this beauty? So on this piece, and I'll pick it up in a second, um, we were hunting about two weeks later, Robert, just Robert and I, and um, I was coming around a very dense brush area and I saw this light speck, I saw the sunlight c glancing off this bright speck and uh, I knew it wasn't, you know, a rock, a local rock. And I called Robert and we went over, we investigated it, and, um, and then while I was go reaching down to pick up the largest piece, Robert looks at me and he goes, Phil, don't move. I thought maybe there was a rattlesnake or something, but he quickly said, um, there's meteorite fragments all around you. We have a shattered meteorite. Wow. And so Robert and I began carefully collecting, and you can see some of the pieces we collected. We put them in a, in a small group on the ground. And this piece in the middle is this piece that we have wow. uh, offered. Wow. It, of the pieces, this is the third largest 
of this shattered meteorite that hit the mesquite tree. It didn't break the mesquite limb, but if you look carefully into where this mesquite limb is, is ripped open, you can see fragments of the meteorite embedded in this. This mesquite branch has been preserved and that, together with the two largest fragments, have been on exhibit first at the Woody Museum in San Antonio for a year, and it's about to start at the Museum of South Texas History for another year. That's amazing. Well, I mean, this, this is a story that you almost couldn't write for TV, so this is, this is fantastic. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this particular specimen and why, it's, why, it, why it should be something so just env envied by collectors? Uh, this, is a, this is a fantastic piece. Um, it, it shows the, the very um, rich black fusion crust on the exterior. There's a little mark of brown on the side which represents where it hit the mesquite, um, probably mesquite bark, and that's been preserved. But when you turn it over, you can see um, just the pristine um, interior, unaltered, no oxidation. This has not experienced any rain or fog or any of that uh, before it was collected. And it's, we've taken great care to preserve it um, in that condition. Absolutely. Well, yeah, no, no hands have touched it, so that's, that's really amazing. Well, this truly is a, a kind of an outstanding story. I don't know anything I can add. Do you have any kind of final points you want to say about it? I'll just uh, we'll talk about that. I'll let people know more about it, and then we'll... So, okay. yes, you're right. This, the experiences like this just don't happen. It's very <laughs> serendipitous. Um, but I will say on, on this one, when we sent the photos, when Robert and I sent the photos to Mark uh, at NASA, um, of the f um, fragmented stone, the shattered stone. Uh, Mark had a, uh, in his wisdom, said uh, meteorite versus mesquite. Mesquite wins. <laughs> the universe has spoken. Outstanding. <laughs> so. Outstanding. Well, you, you can't put a better capper on that. Well, thank you, Phil. This has been enlightening, outstanding. This specimen, along with many other wonderful things, will be in our signature natural history auction on August 28th. It's open right now and live for bidding at www.ha.com slash 8190. And the El Sal's is right there. We've got a bunch of pictures online and recount the story that Phil shared with us about it. So we look forward to you joining us at the end of August. So I thank my friend Phil for being here and thank you for watching. Thank you, Craig.